All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to Cause Streams TV. I'm Cause, and I'm going to be your host today. And today we're doing something a little different than what I usually do with my videos. Today we've created a raid boss tier list specifically for tank design. What that means is this tier list is going to go through the Vault of Incarnates, and we're going to take a look at how each boss feels from a tank perspective only. So you're probably wondering how are we going to rank these bosses? What markers are we going to use to identify whether the boss is well designed or poorly designed? Well, here are the things we're going to consider for each boss. First, we're going to look at positioning. How important is the tank positioning? Does the tank need to move the boss, be in a certain spot? Will it matter? Will it help the healers or the DPS? We're going to take a look at that and take that into consideration. Next, we're going to consider survivability. Does the boss hit hard enough to elicit rotating out defensives or calling for externals when necessary? The third thing we're going to look at is the participation in other mechanics such as soaks or dodges and other things that DPS and healers would usually work with. So does the tank need to help with soaks? Do we have to move out of swirlies and dodges? We're going to look at those things in each boss. And then lastly, we're just going to take a look at the overall boss design and the overall tank mechanics for the boss. For example, how important are the taunt swaps? Can we miss one or two? And will the other tank die because of it? Can this boss be solo tanked early in the tier or later in the tier? Something else we're going to consider is that this tier list is being made with the consideration of how the bosses were when they were released in that season. So we're talking about early on to maybe mid season before they were over geared and before they came super easy. So how was the boss when it was, rele was released? That's what we're looking at. We're also not considering the awakened season. This is just as they were released live in that season. Other things we're going to consider is that earlier bosses are tuned differently and they will have less mechanics. This is not going to impact their overall ranking against later bosses. This means that later bosses aren't weighed higher for having more mechanics and potentially a better design and vice versa. Later bosses aren't ranked lower because they're more complicated and have more mechanics. The last thing we will also touch on is that we will compare the heroic and the mythic versions of these bosses because some of the design actually does improve when you go into, into mythic and on the other side it actually gets worse when you go into mythic. So we will consider both of these but this tier list will specifically focus on ranking the bosses in mythic. So let's jump into the very first boss of Vault of the Incarnates, Aranog. First starting off, this boss doesn't significantly change when you go into Mythic. The main mechanical difference between Heroic and Mythic for Aranog is that in the Mythic version of the fight, the tank will drop an ad called the Flamescale Captain, and then there will also be a second ring that comes from the outside and the inside during the intermission phase. So let's jump into talking about the position of this boss. The recommended strat for this boss was to stay along the outer ring, especially for Mythic, so it was easy to drop the Flamescale Captain right behind the boss, and then you are ready during intermission phase to kill one of the ads during the ring. This also gave your melee healers and other players a lot of room behind the boss to drop the adds and to dodge all of the ground effects that are spawning throughout the fight in heroic the positioning wasn't as important because it was easier to burn through the boss a little quicker and you didn't have that extra add to deal with from the tank so for the scale flame scale captain add the tanks would drop the it slightly behind or to the side of the boss and then all dps players would drop the smaller adds right beside the tank one of the other important positional mechanics was to get you were kiting backwards to give the DPS space behind the boss one to drop the adds and two to move out of all the ground effects volcanoes frontals that may be coming at them although kiting backwards was important it wasn't critical to the point that if you didn't move the boss you weren't able to down it the benefit of a good tank moving the boss backwards is to give everyone space to avoid mechanic and to help melee DPS maintain their uptime and, and maintain ad cleave after the ad spawn Next, let's talk about survivability. So even in Mythic, this boss does not force you to really use your defensives. The Burning Wounds dot is not extremely deadly. There were times when you could go up to three to five stacks depending on your tank class and be able to survive, meaning that at the end of a boss fight, if you were down to one tank due to a mistake, that, that tank could most likely solo tank the boss in the second half. From my own experience, I have been able to take up to three of the ad spawns solo, and I've seen a Vengeance DH when it was live take up to five ad spawns without any issue. So it is almost possible to solo this boss from the second half, but not from the pull. And then of course, and as the season progressed near the end, you could go in and solo tank this with any tank because the boss died extremely quickly. 
So next, let's talk about tank participation. Tanks need to manage the big ad position to make it easier to cleave when it spawns. The tank that spawns it is usually responsible to get the first kick of its cast. The other mechanic that everyone gets to participate in is actually burning down the ad during the intermission phase. So those would be the main participation factors for tanks in this boss. So lastly, let's talk about the overall design and mechanics. In Mythic, the primary tank mechanic is very easily distinguishable because it is a giant ad spawning. This is when the taunt would occur in the fight and the off tank would pick up the boss while the main tank would go and drop the ad off behind it. For a first boss, Aranog was designed very well. It requires positioning in both heroic and mythic versions. It's less important in the heroic version. However, in mythic, it is important to kite backwards so that way your melee can get maintain uptime and it's easier to dodge mechanics. Each tank in Mythic gets to participate in the dropping the ad and kicking it and helping with some of the ad cleave that occurs. As a Blood Death Knight, you could pull some of these smaller ads in to help keep them grouped together and help melee and ranged cleave it. And for a first boss, this had everything it needed to be an engaging and fun fight. If we were only ranking this fight based on the heroic version, we would actually place it in B. However, because the Mythic version adds more to the intermission and adds the ad that the tanks need to deal with, I'm going to rank this boss in the A tier for the mythic version. The second boss in the Vault of the Carnage that we're going to discuss is Taros. Now, Taros is just the boss that stands. Taros is a stationary boss that really has very few mechanics from a tank perspective. Let's first start off with positioning. Well, there is no positioning. The boss doesn't move. It is stuck in a hole and that's where it stays. The raid just moves around the room. Even though you can't position the boss, it is important for the tank that is tanking the boss to ensure that they position themselves correctly for every other concussion slam. This is the beam that comes out of the boss that is usually used to destroy the pillars. If you already destroyed all the pillars, it is important for the tank that has the boss to move off to the side so that way your raid doesn't have to dodge the beam when it comes out. Survivability. This boss could not be solo tanked, but it is possible to take up to four concussion slams with major defensive and externals. By the fourth debuff, this stacks a 50% damage buff on the tank, so by the end of the fight, if you're on the last slice of the room, you may be able to survive if a tank goes down, but the boss needs to be very low health to be able to finish it off. So after the first frenzy devastation, this is when the boss fills up a pie slice of the room. Tanks should start rotating out defenses for the slams due to the amount of damage coming out from breaking more and more awakened earth fragments. These are what I've been calling the pillars. The more pillars you break, the more damage you take. It takes some of the stress off your healers when the tank pops the defensive, so that way they don't need as much healing and take less damage. One of the mythic mechanics is also the reactive bedrock. These are the pillars that spawn underneath players when they clear the mythic debuff. If a tank gets caught in one of these reactive bedrocks, they will not get one shot. They can survive it with no defensive or externals. However, if this happens to a DPS, they are immediately one shot from the reactive bedrock. Bedrock. Well, let's talk about the participation. Tanks are required to help soaking the Rock Blast AoE soak that splits the damage amongst all raid members. That is the main mechanic that all players in the raid have to participate in. The other mechanics tanks get to participate in is the infused fallout. This is the mechanic that leaves an explosive reaction over your head and then reactive bedrock under your feet when you clear with another player. Usually tanks would clear with each other or with each other off to the side or you would group up with the raid as a whole and move together as one to the left so that way all of the pillars spawn in the same spot. Again, tanks can survive standing in one of these reactive bedrock but anyone else would be one shot. And then the last thing the tanks participate in is clearing all of the pillars that spawn with the concussive slam. This can sometimes be frustrating if a DPS doesn't line up their pillar correctly because it's difficult to see whether the beam will or will not hit it. Sometimes you'll see the beam just slightly touching a pillar and miss and other times it'll slightly be touching the pillar and actually clear it. And now let's talk about the overall design and boss mechanics. The main mechanic is to break the awakened earth or the pillars with concussive slam, the beam. The majority of groups will be breaking them all within two slams and then each tank will get to break one set. The importance of awakened earth positioning really falls on the DPS players, healers, and anyone else who gets it. Since the tanks will not see this mechanic, their responsibility is to break it. Tanks may have to swivel their camera sometimes to see if their line is hitting all of the earth pillars and this can be frustrating in 
pugs with no coordination, but the line is a bit forgiving and can still cover a pillar even if only slightly touching it, but sometimes that is also reversed where it's slightly touching it and it doesn't destroy the pillar. Overall, this was a decent second boss. The main challenge was the damage tuning and more coordination and clearing the infused fallout, so at pugs this was definitely challenging as players would be running all over place. Same with soaking, it was very difficult to get pugs to coordinate and line up their pillars effectively. This boss definitely early on in the season was a DPS checks. Even though the mechanics overall weren't very challenging and once you got the dance down, it was easy to get through to the last phase of the fight, the heroic version of this fight really lacked any real danger or threat outside of requiring big healing numbers for each set of pillar breaks, especially later in the fight when there were more pillars to break. But as players got tier and started to outgear it, the heroic really was no challenge at all. Adding the mythic mechanic to clear the infused fallout over your head with another player, that made it more engaging and provided more positioning and overall movement for the boss fight. So taking all of that into consideration, from a tank design, I would place this boss in C tier as it wasn't overall very engaging for tanks and really it was more frustrating watching other players constantly die due to one shot mechanics or not watching their feet and getting hit by the reactive bedrock. Next, we're going to take a look at the, the third boss, which is Senarth. Let's start talking off with positioning. Well, actually, what positioning? The boss controlled herself. Primary thing in regards to positioning was the Frost Breath Arachnid. That was the big ad that spawned and cast the Freezing Breath as a frontal, which would cover the area that it shot the frontal at with ice. Primarily, the tanks were required to position it to face off the edge to limit the amount of floor that it covered in its breath, which wasn't overall very challenging. Jumping into the survivor ability, this boss could not be solo tanked. The web blast stacks 50% for each application and usually require a tank swap around 5 to 7 stacks or as soon as the other tank debuff would drop off you would taunt again. As stacks increase it was recommended to use defensives as it did start hurting significantly. Stacks usually get high during the transitions in Mythic and require defensive, so specifically when you're running from the bottom of the stairs to the top of the stairs, that is when you'd want to use a defensive because you're dodging tornadoes, you're slipping and sliding all over the floor. The other survivability mechanic that was added into this is called enveloping webs. For tanks that aren't demon hunters or death knights, this can be used to completely mitigate the gossamer burst pull that usually would pull players off the edge. But at 10 stacks or 8 stacks, of the webbing, players become webbed and need to have one of the caustic spiderlings, those little spiders that run around, to die underneath them and they cause a caustic eruption which will then clear you out of the web that you were trapped in. These webs were specifically good for that pull in between phases or at the bottom so that way you didn't have to move. And when I did this on my monk, I would dip my feet in into the web just before the burst, stay in it for a little bit and then run out and then try to avoid the avoid them for the rest of the fight so I didn't get up to 8 stacks. And caustic eruptions is what the spiderlings drop that break players out and clear the enveloping web stacks so you can stand on a little swirly and clear your stacks. And then in regards to survivability, your survivability is really dependent on your team because in the last phase of this fight, the tank that is currently tanking the boss will get blasted away and enveloped in webbing and will require these spiderlings broken on it and then tanks will also need to pop these spheres that spawn requiring you sometimes to use a defensive if you are low participation. Overall, this boss had very little participation outside of taunt swapping. The majority of this fight is specifically around using the caustic eruptions to clear out web players and tanks on the final platform. Because the spiderlings focus on a DPS player, that player or healer would be required to bring the spiderlings over to a web tank or a web player. The raid would blast the, those spiderlings down and that would break those players out. There is a little more participation in the mythic version, especially on the final platform during chilling blast. This now leaves a glacial plum. It doesn't need to be clear to it away but later in as the room fills out one or two will get cleared and the tanks participate in helping clear a little more of these because our health pool was always higher than the dps and heal healer players jumping into the jumping into the overall design and mechanics from a tank's perspective this is basically a taunt when stacks are high kind of boss but it moves on its own there's very little to focus on we can help with positioning and pulling some of the ad little ads around but they will run off and then our main thing is to focus on the large ad the arachnid and ensure that we are facing it off the edge which is simple to do because when it drops you taunt it and as long as you are near the edge it'll come to you and face the edge automatically. Heroic was very simple mainly because it didn't have the added challenge that Mythic does. Mythic adds the frozen stairs and tornadoes to dodge in between each platform so as you're going up now you're dodging tornadoes and the floor is slippery the whole time. In the Mythic version adding the arena environmental changes so the frozen stairs and tornadoes makes this boss more challenging and does require tanks to focus on movement while heading up the stairs instead of just standing on the boss and DPS 
BSing the whole time like you could in Heroic. Overall, the fight was okay, but lacked any real tank engagement. The Heroic version of this fight really drops its rank down, but with the mythic changes to the arena, we're going to bring it up a tier. I tried this boss on both my Monk and my Death Knight and feel bad for anyone who isn't a Demon Hunter or Death Knight to have wings to fly or Death's Advance to completely ignore the pull mechanic. So originally the Heroic version of this fight would land in the D tier, but due to the environmental arena changes, we're going to place this in C because it is a very, very unengaging boss for tanks. And next up, we're going to go into the fourth boss of the raid, and we're going to talk about the, the Primal Council. The main changes to this boss between Heroic and Mythic is that the Conductive Mark no longer disappears unless, unless the player with the Mark touches the Pillar. What that means is that in normal and heroic, the mark would actually drop off of you, so you didn't have to touch a pillar. In mythic, if a tank gets the mark, that mark is permanently stuck on the tank, and it's very challenging for them to run off and clear because they have to run through the raid. The other change to the heroic and mythic versions is that scorched ground now shrinks from during primal blizzard. So when you run into the fire to clear your cold stacks, that pool will shrink. Primal blizzard, if not cleared, once it hits 10 stacks, will freeze the player completely in a frozen tomb that needs that they need to be broken out of so let's talk about the positioning of this boss this is a council style fight and it does require tanks to rotate the boss around the room rotating the boss around the room helps with pillar management and provides dps space to stay behind the boss to avoid hitting tanks with conductive marks which in mythic can only be cleared via a pillar and as mentioned earlier it's difficult for a tank to do that because they have to run through the raid this also provides space for when the meteor axe comes out and needs to be soaked sometimes melee dps needs to run out and help with that so having the bosses move slightly around the room provides placement for the axe and the pillars to spawn and spots for everyone to clear their conductive marks another important thing when it comes to positioning during this boss fight is while rotating around the room tanks need to be mindful of the frontal from m bar fire path tanks will usually continue to face him off towards the edge the off tank that has opal fang will stand just off to the side of the tank that has fire pass so they're not also hit with the frontal jumping into survivability opal fang does an ability called crush crush does physical damage and stacks a hundred percent increased physical damage debuff on the tank that is hit this is when the tank swap occurs and when tanks should be using defensive to survive the crush hit is physical so anything that lowers physical damage is, is what you would want to use taking both the slashing blaze frontal from Embar and crush from opal fang does get deadly taking two or more sets of these will lead to a tank's death therefore this this fight was very difficult to solo tank from the beginning and even later in the tier it was not very possible it is recommended to rotate defenses for each crust and during primal blizzard if there's something you can use because of the amount of damage that's going out having healers focus less on the tanks and more on the rest of the raid was very important so due to the very deadly mechanics that occur this boss was not soloable throughout the tier jumping into, into participation tanks have a significant role in managing the boss placement during this encounter pulling the boss off to the edge too much leaves very little room for the tanks to be able to stay off to the side to avoid getting hit by getting hit by the frontal and then eventually due to the pillar spawning very close to the boss you run out of room to move so it's important to keep the bosses kind of on the outer ring and then moving around the room tanks also participate in the primal blizzard they have to run into the fire so otherwise they have to run into the fire to clear their primal blizzard stacks otherwise they will be entombed one of the mechanics we actually don't want to participate in is conductive marks this is something we want to avoid and it really depends on the boss position positioning in our character placement during frontals if for any reason a dps if we walk into a dps behind or beside the boss we will get a conductive mark and that's something we want to avoid it is very important that dps manage the marks effectively and don't run over tanks in mythic there's also a kick rotation for dathia and kadros this is something tanks who have a ranged kick could participate in such as death knights and paladins death knights with mind freeze and paladins with their avenging shield tanks that have a short range kick would not participate in this because sometimes kadros and dathia aren't close Close enough to be kicked and you don't want to be turning the boss around in the event a frontal is about to go off speaking to overall boss design and mechanics there's a lot happening during this fight and can easily get overwhelming and difficult to maintain room space tanks are often pushed to the edge of the room naturally and larger moves need to occur to get out of all the scorched earth around the raid and the pillars that continue to spawn closer and closer and these pillars are needed by dps to clear the less room you have the more conductive marks go out there's more potential for tanks to get the mark and there's less and less room to actually 
actually be able to move, eventually stacking high enough to kill the raid. Tanks want to stay five yards beside each other so that the frontal doesn't hit both tanks and then the, the taunt swap can occur safely. Overall, for a potential third or later boss, this is a very fun fight to tank as it is a little bit of everything. Clearing stacks, positioning and rotating the boss, watching frontals, and, and dealing with DPS trying to give you conductive mark hugs. It's a very fun fight. So considering this this fight both from a heroic and mythic perspective, yes mythic is the fight does not change very much going from mythic to heroic, the numbers are significantly different and it, it was a tight DPS check early, I'm going to place this in B tier as it was a very fun fight to tank, but overall it didn't have very many engaging tank mechanics, the tank mechanics that we would need to worry about. Next up, we're going to talk about Dathia. The heroic and mythic versions of Dathia actually do have a significant change. In heroic, an ad will spawn that needs to be pulled off to the side where a group of players will be blasted up to a platform to kill the ads that spawn. In the mythic version, each infuser is laying around the room and usually they'll be marked with raid markers and players will get conductive mark. Players want to take the conductive mark to the infuser to charge it. Once the infuser is charged, it spawns and then it is taken over and DPS down for the for the raid to get black for a for half of the raid to get blasted up to combat the ads on the platform jumping into the positioning of this fight this is another stationary boss the critical positioning only happens during the volatile infuser ad spawns in heroic what that means is that when the infuser spawns the tank wants to wants to know which platform the ads are spawning on and drag the infuser over to that to position it nearby this then helps the players in the middle of the room not be blasted off of the platform and the players that need to go to the ad platform get blasted onto the ad platform safely this is the same mechanic in both Heroic and Mythic. The difference is that in Mythic, the Infuser ad is activated by DPS. Positioning the Infuser incorrectly and having it potentially explode in the middle of the room could lead to an immediate wipe as players aren't able to get onto the ad platform or other players are blown off the main platform due to how close the ad was and how strong the blowback is. Speaking to survivability, the main take mechanic is the Zephyr Slam. Each Zephyr Slam increases in damage and knockback distance by 50%, meaning that by the third hit, tanks usually want to tank swap because having the fourth or fifth hit will, will definitely blast you off the main platform unless you're a Death Knight with Disadvance or a Vengeance Demon Hunter and you could actually just fly back and almost mitigate it completely. Eventually though, going past five stacks will one-shot any tank. If you're playing a Death Knight, you do have the ability to use Disadvance during Coalescing Storms. This is the mechanic where the boss pulls the entire raid into the middle of the room and then if you get hit, you get blasted into the air and could potentially die from fall damage. So you, if as a DK, you use Disadvance to mitigate that, be mindful of how many stacks you get of Zephyr Slam because death advance may not be available for you when you need it most jumping into the participation there are there really is no dps or healer mechanics tanks participate in the main thing tanks will, would participate in is picking up the ad and moving and positioning it near the ad platform and then going up to the ad platform and killing the ads in the rare chance that tanks get marked with the conductive mark we would want to take it to a dormant infuser but it is something we want to avoid and not something we would commonly get as we are standing away from the rest of the raid our main responsibility is to position a spawned infuser correctly once launched to the ad platform any tanks that have the the ability to aoe interrupt and easily group the ads benefit in this phase so demon hunter chains uh, death knights with a bomb limb or gorfine's graphs those are very beneficial when you are on the ad platform i did this on both my death knight and my monk it was a lot more challenging on the monks the monk only has eight kick and ring of peace so it's difficult to pull all the ads together and i really needed a death knight or something someone else on my platform to be able to coordinate pulling all the ads in. If you're playing a Paladin, you can also use Divine Told to, to AoE kick all of the casts, and that would also help you group the ads a little bit. But other tanks such as Druid, Monks, and Ors would require some external assistance to get everything brought together, such as having a DK on the platform or coordinating kicks and rops and pushes between Druids, Evokers, and Monks. So touching on the overall design and mechanics of the fight, there aren't really many mechanics tanks need to worry about outside of how many Zephyr stacks you take. The third stack knocks you, knocks you to the edge of the platform. Failing to return quick enough could also cause the boss to turn in one shot one of the melee dps and mythic if no tank is in range depending on the tank being played the responsibilities will vary slightly and their chance of survival becomes dependent on their ability to effectively use their toolkit for example at four stacks monks can use transcendence warriors and druids could use their charger but paladins may have a bit of a problem after that because they will get pushed off the edge what you can do is actually position yourself with a tornado behind you and when you take that fourth or fifth stack the tornado will bop you into the air the thing you need to be careful with that is in the event 
event that you are in the air for too long, the boss is going to turn and one-shot a melee. The heroic version of this boss is obviously easier to manage since the infuser spawns at a set interval. For Mythic, this fight becomes significantly more challenging as conductive marks need to be managed. The only way to clear a mark is to charge an infuser, and if you spread the marks, you can end up causing an infuser too early, and that can cause issues with the pull if the ads aren't ready on the platform yet. When this fight was live in that season, it was chaotic trying to progress due to mark management and, and became a wall for many guilds. This is something I didn't have to experience. However, even during the Awakened season and how much we outgeared this boss, our team decided that we were only going to clear one of the ad platforms and then just stay on the main platform until we completely nuked the boss. Which means even later when you, we kind of outgeared this boss, we didn't. We wanted to avoid the actual mechanics of this boss just to get through it. So outside of the comments about Awakened, this boss overall the heroic version of this boss i would rate in the d tier however due to the very little amount of tank engagement and the frustration of watching dps players mess up the mars get blown off the platform in the mythic version i'm going to rate this as a d as it was not a very fun fight to progress through and everyone i have spoken to about this fight does not look upon it fondly and next up, we're going to talk about Kurog, the sixth boss in the Vault of Incarnates. And let's jump right into the positioning of this boss. The positioning does matter in this fight prim primarily on where and when you move the boss. The room is split into the four elements and tanks need to pull the boss into one of them to start the fight. And then when the boss reaches a certain amount of percentage, especially in Mythic, which is usually near about 90, 97%, you move him into the other element. The purpose of this is that the element that was tanked, that the boss was tanked in before the intermission, those are the ads you will get so if the boss is tanked in fire and then ice you will have the fire and ice elemental spawn during an mission in heroic this fight was a bit more forgiving and you're able to move the boss into another element of the room at around 80 to 90 percent energy and deal with the new mechanics as they weren't as deadly in mythic the strat was to move the boss at the very last second from fire to lightning because the lightning mechanic was very difficult to deal with and during the first intermission you specifically wanted the fire and lightning ads to spawn once the boss comes out of its first phase tanks would move Karog into the earth side of the room and basically keep him there in indefinitely this is mainly because in mythic you will get the earth and ice spawn next because you've already done the fire and lightning ads during the intermissioning positioning the ads did not matter you can move anywhere in the room you just wanted to ensure that melee could continue dpsing them while dealing with mechanics and any other ad spawns survivability the primary mechanic for the tank is the Sunderstrike, a frontal and a knockback in heroic and mythic in Mythic difficulty, there is an additional ad that spawns in each section of the room that tanks need to pick up and taunt swap on as both the boss and the ad do unique frontals. It is recommended to use defenses for each Sunder to mitigate some of the damage. In Mythic, the active tank who takes the Sunder taunts the ad, which will begin to melee the tank. Having a defensive rolling with active mitigation helps healers focus on keeping the DPS up instead of tanks during those frontal hits. Participation. There are raid-wide mechanics tanks need to be part of. The fire dance is one of those during the fire phase that requires the whole raid to shift left or right depending on your positioning. So tanks get to move with the raid across the room. Since we're moving the boss so late into the lightning phase, there's nothing for us to deal with there. During the earth phase, tanks need to pick up the four ads that spawn in both heroic and mythic and then dodge the ground AoE with the raid. In the mythic version of the earth phase, both Kurog and the ad will spawn the AoE on the ground and at one point it's important to separate the boss and the ad to off set this mechanic otherwise the room will fill up and there is nowhere to dodge the ground aoe mechanics and then we always finished in the frost phase the frost phase has two soaks one usually stays with melee which the tanks can stand in and help and the other one is a range soak that occurs in the frost zone both krog and the ad will now have ice spheres that spawn out of them that players need to dodge if the boss and ad are together you may not have room to actually dodge them because they are offset it's important to move the boss out so overall boss design and mechanics being being a middle boss of the raid it had minimal impacts in regards to how this boss interacts with tanks positioning is only important at the beginning of the fight and after the first intermission and ensuring that the ads are split up when they need to be outside of that it is heavily focused on external factors that the rest of the raid participate in taking mythic into consideration which now provides a second ad in each elemental phase that gives tanks an extra taunt mechanic another component of the encounter to consider especially when the earth and frost ads 
do the same mechanic as the boss and should be split up at a certain point. There's many different dodging ground effects, dodges, and soaks that tanks actually get to participate in, in this. So this fight gives tanks just enough to do without being a cognitive overload. It was very fun and enjoyable to prog in Season 1, and it was also a DPS check for our guild. Taking all of that into consideration, I would place Kurog in B tier as overall it was a very engaging fight for tanks. Next up, we have the second to last boss in the Vault of the Incarnates, Broodkeeper Diurna. Let's jump into the positioning of this boss. This was probably one of the most engaging tank fights in regards to positioning. For the boss tank, it was critical that they know the pathing to avoid bringing the boss too close to the adds, mainly due to the Broodkeeper's Bond. Broodkeeper's Bond was a 50 yard range requirement, and this would buff the boss and the adds and basically wipe the raid due to raid-wide AoE from the dragons and abilities that were occurring. Both the heroic and the mythic version actually had different pathing requirements for the add tank and the boss tank. Here's an example of what the pathing looked like for both heroic and mythic and how it varied. From a design perspective, it's cool to see how a, how a fight can change just due to pathing, and this was successfully accomplished for the heroic and mythic versions of this fight for both tanks during the encounter. So in regards to positioning, both the ad and boss tanks had to know the routing. One thing that the tank that was tanking the adds had to do is eventually they had to start kiting the remaining adds before the next set spawned because they wouldn't always die right away, so you'd get that added mechanic of having to run over there at the right time and picking up that next set before the boss got too close or before you dragged it across the room and the boss had to move as well as the season progressed though that was less of concern because as player item level increased you were able to nuke the ads down fast enough and then just go to the next set naturally i myself wasn't able to actually try the mythic version of this fight but i've seen many videos and talked to other players who did it once you were out of phase one phase two required very little positioning and in heroic you just had to dodge the fire swirlies and run away from the storm fixtures spawning from the staff in regards to survivability Early in the season, the strategy for this for this boss was actually to run three tanks. The reasoning behind running three tanks was the Mortal Wounds debuff, which reduced healing received by 65% on the active tank. Having two tanks on the boss helped tanks survive early on, as this could not really be mitigated in any way. Having defensives, externals helped with the physical damage of the initial hit, but the healing debuff caused issues with for survivability, especially early on. So there would be two tanks that would handle the boss and taunt on every Mortal Wounds, and then the third tank could continue to solo the adds and be part of the kick rotation for ice barrage that was from the primal mages for the ad tank each set of adds did actually have tank busters and, and did significant damage which would require you to roll your defensives as much as possible and have them for important phases in heroic defensive weren't really used during phase two as it could be solo tanked the primary mechanics require dodging the ground AoE and ensuring DPS don't chase you down with the storm fixtures from the stat. Let's talk about the participation. This fight could be easily failed by either tank getting too close to each other with the boss and adds, and the boss tank really controlled the flow of the fight. If the tank positioned too far from an egg or incubated the incorrect eggs, it made the fight more challenging and user resulted in a wipe early in the season. Incubating the wrong egg basically meant having other players improvise and not double up on breaking the same egg or missing the third egg that you had to crack that usually wasn't marked with any timer above it. Early in the season when three tanking, the off tank would usually break this third egg, but eventually later in the season, the, the tank that was on the boss could break the third egg and continue tanking the boss. So speaking to the overall design and the mechanics, Broodkeeper Diurna might have been chaotic for most melee DPS due to the heavy amount of movement throughout the fight, but this is exactly what tanks needed compared to some of the bosses that require very little thought for tanks outside of let's taunt now. The idea behind the boss having their health linked to the number of eggs remaining in the room made it a much more engaging fight later as raiders required more gear and were able to sometimes even break up to four eggs to speed up reaching phase two, specifically in, in heroic. Phase two became a DPS race in a sense as the damage from the great staff storm fixtures would pulse significantly and anyone too close to it would die and then also this doubled up the, the wildfire that spawned on the ground so you had to move twice. Failing to move out of a wildfire or, or getting hit by both would cause a death both in Heroic and Mythic and then the Mortal Wounds debuff still happened in Phase 2 and then for tanks the Mortal Wounds debuff continued to happen even in Phase 2 but now with the second tank available to taunt it was no longer as challenging so this is why later in the season that third tank was dropped and the fight was handled with only two. Taking all of that into consideration, the positioning, the survivability, and just the overall requirement for tanks to really 
they'll think on the fly and sometimes ensure they're breaking the white egg or not to overlap an egg that's being broken. This fight for me ranks higher as it was probably the most engaging tank fight in the entire raid, in the entire Vault of the Carnage raid. So I am putting Diurna in the S tier in regards to a tank, in regards to being a fantastic boss for tanks, whether you're on ad, ad duty or boss duty. And last up, let's talk about the final boss of Vault of the Incarnates, the very first raid of Dragonflight, Razagath the Storm Eater. I didn't get to participate in the mythic version of this fight. I saw it during the Race to World first, and I saw a lot of kills after some of the changes to the boss mechanics. So I'm heavily really speaking about the heroic version, although I do think that in Mythic the added challenges could potentially make this a more frustrating boss, but a very satisfying boss to kill. So let's jump into it and let's talk about positioning. In phase one, positioning was more important during Mythic as you had to pull the boss over to the edge of the room, but in heroic it wasn't as important. You basically keep the boss in the in the middle of the room the whole time for all three phases. In both heroic and Mythic, you had the volatile current mechanic this was the large circle that spawned around each player and left the volatile spark that it that needed to be kicked twice in heroic or three times in mythic the strat was eventually just to have two or three players stacked together three if you could survive it and then aoe stun as many sparks as possible in the first intermission ad phase there really wasn't any positioning to deal with the big ads had predetermined spawn points and once the shield was broken the lads would spawn around them you could eventually move the little ads over to the next big ad but it was very it was all predefined and scripted so positioning really wasn't that important in the first ad intermission phase during phase two or the second second boss platform again positioning of the boss was irrelevant the Razagath would stay in the middle of the room and you didn't have to move her. The biggest thing for tanks though when it came to positioning was ensuring that you could survive the Tempest Wing push, so staying closer to the middle of the boss when it comes out, it did less of a push and you took less damage. Position yourself with volatile sparks, that was the mechanic that occurred, and lastly you had the new mechanic Storm Surge which, which gave the entire raid a positive or negative charge and each set of raiders had to stack in their respective charge and basically it would increase the amount of damage and healing you do by 200% to help you get through the shield. In Heroic and Mythic you didn't want to run through another player as it as you took significant damage when you interacted with the opposite charge. So that was something tanks did get to participate in. So self positioning was important through all the phases in the boss fight. During the second ad intermission that is when the colossal storm feed spawn. Again there is no movement outside of dodging Razagad's breath, the ad spawn place is predetermined, and so are the teleports when the ads teleport around the room. The only thing that tanks really need to deal with is when the Stormlings come out, tanks want to help stun or grip or keep the ads in the middle of the room so they can be nuked down effectively so they won't heal the Colossal Storm Fiends. Phase 3 or the third platform for Razagad, this is where positioning was somewhat important, mainly due to the tank that was on Razagath should not be facing the boss towards the raid or with anyone in the raid due to the thunderous burst that Frazagath would do. Thunderous Blast would be mitigated by the active tank and if a DPS, a healer, or any other raid member was in that frontal and didn't mitigate it, that AoE damage would be amplified to the rest of the raid which sometimes could cause a wipe if multiple people were hit by that tank mechanic. And then the off tank during the third platform would just either stand with the raid behind the boss or off to the side they can taunt the boss as soon as the blast is over. So there wasn't a lot of boss positioning in this encounter, it was mainly focused on being aware of the raiders around you and the mechanics that were coming up and positioning yourself accordingly. Jumping into survivability, the main tank mechanic throughout the fight was electrified jaws. Tanks would usually taunt after each electrified jaws. You could take up to two or more, but once you reach two, you would use a defensive or you would call for an external because each stack increases the amount of physical damage taken by 100%. So once you hit three stacks, you're at 300%. The fourth may one shot any tank. That was the main mechanic that tanks had that was unique to them. Outside of that, the tanks were treated as any other member of the raid team and they they had to be mindful of, of everything that was occurring during the Razagath encounter because basically everything was trying to kill us. Volatile currents, 
Lightning Breath Frontals, Storm Surge, Tempest Wings, more Sparks, Fulminating Charges, and Mitigating the Thunderous Blast in P3, we got to participate in everything, and our survivability depended on how well we used our toolkit, how well we used our defensives, and how well we called for externals if we were getting low and we needed them. And sometimes healers didn't have them because DPS were also struggling with the exact same mechanics we were. So survivability really depended on how well we knew our class and how well we could mitigate in the worst scenarios. Once the boss reached the third platform, it would be possible for a tank to solo at least two thunderous blasts, maybe a third with the with a defensive and some externals. This would really depend on if you had enough defensives and had the externals to mitigate the thunderous blast enough. If not mitigated enough, it will wipe the raid as the damage that is mitigated then causes the AoE nature damage to be lowered to the rest of the raid team. So in P3, you could potentially get away with solo tanking at most three thunderous blasts in regards to participation i think we've touched on this topic in in our previous two areas for survivability and positioning as i mentioned tanks participated in almost everything that razagath threw at them since most mechanics were raid wide and had some aspect of either dodging kicking stunning running through or avoiding tanks didn't have any unique mechanics to deal with but they did have raid wide mechanics throughout the entire encounter and so we're not going to go over all all of these mechanics and how they worked and what we had to do to survive but it would be safe to say that this boss required the entire raid team to know their class and know their survivability toolkit speaking to the overall design and mechanics of the boss we could sit down and break and start breaking down each phase and each mechanic but i think coming off of a final boss like sylvanas and then coming into razagath the flow and design of razagath which was still a 12 minute fight was well thought out and made it a very satisfying boss encounter when we finally down this boss the 12 minutes that it took did not even feel that long everything flowed so well and there's very few pauses which made this such an interactive encounter i unfortunately wasn't able to attempt this in mythic but even the heroic version early on in the tier before we outgeared it felt great to progress through although the ad phases didn't add much to the fight and some people would say that it really caused a slowdown compare that to how the sylvanas had in permission works which caused you to run across change wait for ads to spawn the flow of razagath was very much improved. The first ad platform was simple. Dodge the breath from Razagath, kill the big ad, and then move to the next one. Return to the second platform and start the boss fight again, which then immediately on the same platform started the second ad intermission. And the second and these second ads, although stationary, added the mechanic of when they teleport, Thormlings will spawn and try to reach the ad they spawn from to heal it. That created the strategy of waiting for all of the ads to group up in the middle or using things like chains, Gorfin's grass, a bomb limb to keep them in the middle, start them all and then nuking them all down together if the stormlings reached the storm fiend they would heal the big ad which extended the boss duration and most likely would cause a wipe each platform had just the right of added mechanics changed mechanics and provided different strategies to get through the changes successfully for a for the final boss of dragon's flight's first raid this boss had a little bit of everything and really required the entire raid to understand their class understand survival survivability plan out healer cooldown and ensure tanks could mitigate the damages specifically in the on the third platform so i think blizzard did a fantastic job coming off of shadowlands and bringing razagath to life and making it our final encounter in the vault of incarnates so where do we rank razagath keeping in mind that from a tank's perspective we didn't have a lot of unique tank abilities to deal with outside of electrified jaws we were just another another dps in the raid dealing with all of the same mechanics everybody else was overall i do think this fight is s tier because of how engaging it was but in uniqueness to what tanks have to deal with, there's no positioning for most of the fight. There's almost no positioning that we have to deal with. And then the electrified jaws isn't that dangerous. And then really P3 mitigating. Tanks weren't the pass fail mechanic for this boss. It really came down to the entire raid being able to survive what was thrown at them. So overall, even though I think this is an S tier fight, I'm going to place it in A because this tier list is based off how tanks experienced the bosses from their unique perspective and realistically Razagath was more of a boss that required full raid participation and more often than not it was deaths due to other raid wide mechanics that caused this to be a pass or a check not so much tanks missing a taunt swap or positioning the boss incorrectly so overall Razagath is in the A tier and that is it for our tier list for Vault of the Incarnates. Here it is one more time for you guys to take a look. 
I hope you enjoyed the video. I am planning on potentially doing this for the other raids. I would love to hear your feedback. If you're a tank, do you agree with my tier list? Do you think it should be different? Did I miss something that maybe I should cover in another video when I do the other raids? Do DPS and healers agree on some of my points? Let me know in the comments down below what you think and what maybe we could change or do better next time. But I hope you guys enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys on the next one when we take a look at Aberus, the Shadowed Crucible, the second raid of Dragon flight coming up in a later video thank you once again you guys for watching and i'll see you on the next one peace out everybody